First of all, I want to thank uh, Inya and Eva for their invitation. So, in order to get right into the heart of the matter, let's begin with a sound excerpt in which you will hear a passage of the Prelude à l'après-midi d'un phone, recorded around 1921 by one of the best orchestra of the Belle Époque, the Orchestre L'Amoureux. Debussy maintained a close relationship with this ensemble, to which he entrusted the first performances of several of his works, including La Mer in 1905. Since most of the wind soloists from 1905 were present in 1921, we can reasonably think that we will hear the distant echoes of La Mer. I choose rather long excerpts in order to take the time to immerse into the soundscape of the period. So this is the first example. we can all agree that the crackling background nose creates an impressionist blur which considerably interferes with our listening. The same is true for the two sides of this recording of the prelude and it is also the case for the seven pieces engraved in 1921 by the Orchestre L'Amoureux. This throws us straight into the problem that I wish to address today, namely the limitations of all recordings in the study of instrumental styles. Indeed, even if audio documents are a precious asset in this area, the quality of some of them forces us to turn over other, other sources, from some of them written sources. But here again, we come up against another pitfall. Frequently, the press releases and other written testimonies of this period boil down to simple laudatory remarks and lack sufficient details about the playing style, especially for the wind instruments. As the vast majority of the members of the Orchestre L'Amoureux studied at the Conservatoire de Paris, it is possible to find interesting details about their playing in the archives of this institution. Before competing for the first prize around mid-July, the students had to pass two exams, one in January and another in June, for which the teachers and members of the exam committee left comments. Cruising these numerous assessments with historical recordings allows us to get a fairly precise idea of the ideal playing style of that time. So, for this lecture, I will focus on the specificities of the playing style of French wind players. First of all, it seems useful to briefly present the French wind school. Um, France has always been famous for its, its wind players, even as far well as the 18th century. During this time, however, there were mainly some well-known virtuosos, but it was not a general phenomenon. The situation will greatly change over the next century with the creation of the Conservatoire in 1795 and the effects of its teaching. Indeed, at the end of the 19th century, French wind players enjoy a unique aura, more precisely the instruments of the wind quintet. It was particularly evident in the press, where critics increasingly emphasized the excellence of these classes during the Conservatoire competition. This competition, the most brilliant, the most remarkable of all, we conclude this year's series with dignity. If the critics do not give more detail about the specificities of students' playing style, these praise are a signal of the evolution of the musical taste until they mainly centered on voices, piano and strings. In addition to the high level of these classes, wind classes, the idea developed in the last years of the 19th century that wind instrumentalists were the only ones to have an adequate attitude toward their art. They change as they go by. One day, the people who live on makeup and lies, 
the next actors of all calibers, and today the parade of honest artists. Visiting foreign orchestra in Paris at the end of the 19th century reinforced the idea of the superiority of the French wind school. Indeed, the comparison with the German, Viennese, and Italian winds allowed the critics to make more precise descriptions and to thus more subtly grasp the qualities cultivated by French wind player. For example, if most of the French critics mentioned the high level of horn players at the Berlin Philharmonic, several had several several had several critics, sorry, had reservations about their sound quality, which went for dull and colorless. But this is in the we can also find concerning German woodwind players. Reciprocally, the big concern in Germany by the French Wind Instrument Society, a critic noted an intonation and technical elegance that are inaccessible, and the number one subtle specified that the sound of the French oboes and horn was, I quote, more sharp, cutting, and potent than in Germany. So, what does the French wind school consist of? In a pragmatic and simplified way, I suggest to define it as a playing style characterized by three criteria. The cult of a clear, fine sound, the predilection for virtuosity and light playing, and the use of vibrato. With that in mind, let's go back to the soloist of the Orchestre Lamoureux, whose distant echoes we heard earlier, beginning with the flutist Pierre Deschamps. Because of the time limit, I will only briefly show you the information of the musician's career. Pierre Deschamps entered the conservatoire at the age of 16, where he studied for five years. Only in his last year did he study under Paul Tafanel, who came to be known as the father of the French Free School. The cursus of Deschamps and the conservatoires was laborious. Here, I prepare for you a selection of 30 or so comments that can be found about him in the archives of the conservatoire. After the compliments he received of the first exam in January 1819, the members of the exam committee frequently noted a lack of finesse. In January 1891, Tafanel Jude is playing a little jockey, while Vetke went so far as to describe his style as rude and too nervous. The assessment from other years confirmed that, despite good technique, some aspect of his defects persisted until the end of, of his musical training in 1894. There are very few recordings of Deschamps playing solo that can help us to spot what he was being marked on for. Here is one engraved in 1910 in which he performs Bizet Mutué from the Arlesienne. The comparison of the 78 RPM with those accorded by other flutists revealed a slightly less flexible phrasing, but the difference in minor. Like his colleagues, Deschamps cultivated a clear sound and used vibrato, but he did it so in a more parsimonious way, especially at the start of this menuet where certain notes were played without any expressive undulation. Would this be the type of roughness that he was reproaching for 50 years earlier? Anyway, the criticism of the jury shows one thing, the paramount value of delicacy and sweetness. Now, let's move on on the case of the musician we saw previously in the photo of Pierre Deschamps, the oboist um, Fernand Gillet. At the Conservatoire, Gillet was the student of his uncle, of his uncle, Georges Gillet, a major figure of the French wind school. 
George Gillet taught for 38 years at the Conservatoire and trained more than 60 recipients of the first prize. But let's return to his nephew, Fernand Gillet. His courses at the Conservatoire were very different from that of Pierre Deschamps. The exam committee's comments were always laudatory insofar as his style and the quality of his tone were concerned. Turban, one of the most demanding jewels, wrote in June 1898, very beautiful artist natural, delicate and colorful playing, expressive. We can see, however, that Georges Gillet always stayed neutral on his comments about his nephew. The two excerpts that I'm going to offer you now allows us to fully grasp the sound qualities of Fernand Gillet. The first one that dates from 1905 and the second one from 1946. Forty years later, Next, you will hear a colleague of Fernand Gillet doing the first performance of La Mer in 1905, the clarinetist Henri Lefebvre. Having led the orchestra Lamoureux in 1913, he is the only wind soloist who does not play in the 1921 recordings. So, at the Conservatoire, Lefebvre's good potential was gathered from the very first exams. Um, Dupont, a duo who was often very laconic in his comments, wrote in January 1885, good sound, six well, sings well. But six months later, reservations were expressed. Tafanel reproached him with a screeching sound, criard in French, and Turban an unfocused sound. But the jury remained unanimous on his technical and musical quality thereafter, even Turban, who was a, a very famous clarinetist at that time. Let me draw your attention to the word facilité that we can see in the comments from that period, which could be translated as ease or fluency. It corresponds to what we call lightness today, but also applies to virtuosity and fingering. Um, the next sound excerpt allows us to hear a piece that Lefebvre recorded at least four times during his career. His predilection for this piece could most likely be explained by the fact that it's particularly highlighted his facility. In the version you, we are going to hear, you will spot an expressive tremor on two of the highest notes. An article written, written by one of the students confirmed that Lefebvre used to use vibrato on the highest points of musical phrases only. Here there is external. Henri Lefebvre recorded many pieces of chamber music with bassoonist Ernest Bessantini, who I will talk about now. Bessantini entered the conservatoire at 60 years old, where his studies were spent rather serenely. It is worth noting that his teacher was one of the last great romantic virtuosos of the bassoon, Eugène Jancourt. During exams, 
The members of the committee, like his teacher, often emphasized his musical qualities. This was rare because the bassoon suffered from a very bad reputation at the time, both in the press and in the writings of the members of the exam committee. In addition to the instrumental quality notes for Vicentini, we see in 1891 a new type of compliment, vibrant stone or vibrant sound. As the codifier vibrant could have several meanings in French, it is highly likely that it refers here to the use of vibrato. This detail is really interesting because the mention of vibrato is raw in the archives of the conservatoire. We generally find it in the form of criticism, both among singers and instrumentalists. These approaches are often formulated in using the word chevrotement, goat-like bleeding. The way Vicentini used vibrato, therefore, seemed to sweet the ears of the time, and we can hear it in all the recordings he made. Here are two examples of this playing dating from 1907 and 1905. Please note that in the 1905 recording, the oboist is Georges Gillet, the famous uncle of Fernand Gillet, and the clarinetist is Henri Lefebvre. Here are those two examples. So now is the time to move on to the last soloist I want to introduce you to, the hornist Emile Lambert, which was on a, one of the very best ones of the time. Born in Belgium, Emile Lambert began his training at the Mons Conservatory. The compliments of the jury during his first exam in Paris suggest that he received solid musical training. Franchon emphasized that he was the best of the class. And six months later, Ambroise Thomas, very strangely with compliments for wins, reward him with does well, beautiful town. We can also see that Surnes was very important for horn players at that time, as today. So the comments about Lambert from the Conservatoire, although quite laconic, confirm what we saw previously for other wins. For that time, a beautiful tone had to be clear. This is confirmed by the fact that students could be criticized for having a muffled, trouble, or cottony sound. In the case of Lambert, we have, in addition to the accounts of the Conservatoire, a precious written sources. The testimony of Reginald Molly Peck, a British horn player who worked in Paris at the beginning of the 20th century and who played alongside Lambert. This testimony sheds a fairly explicit light on the lyrical dimension of his playing. Molly Peck's words are all the more interesting in that they are part of a comparison between Lambert and the famous English horn player, Dennis Bray. I will only quote the passages here. Lambert, I quote, had a manner of singing on the horn like the inculture Italian tenor, not knowing how he did it, nor why. And it was a pure joy to listen to him in a melodic phrase, never rising beyond metaphor 40, but coming right through the orchestra as clear as a bell. In this comment, Molly Peck alludes to the vibrato with the mention of the Italian tenor, as well as the delicacy and clearness of Lambert's sonority. So, as we, as we begin with music, it's interesting to end in the same way, listening the, to the beginning of the Prélude de la Prémie de phone, in which we can appreciate the clear and singing tone of Pierre Deschamps, Fernand Gillet, 
and Emile Lambert. Although this recording is particularly noisy and foggy, we can still hear the distant echoes of the pinnacle of the Fenwin School at the dawn of the 20th century. Many thanks for your attention.